Let's begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again, Lord. I just thank you for the students. Just pray that you'd help us to use this time wisely, just to glorify you, Lord, in what we do. Here I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I started talking about, um, ordinarily I'd say are there questions, but our class kind of got, <clears throat> well, you know. So let's continue talking about hyperbolic functions. I have a few things to tell you. So what did we learn last time? Basically, we learned that we can talk about cosh, right? Cosh of x is 1 half e to the x plus e to the minus x. And we also had cinch. Um, cinch x was 1 half e to the x minus e to the minus x, right? So these are hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine. And, of course, the uh, other thing we noticed was the derivative of cosh is cinch, right? And the derivative of cinch is cosh. All right. So there's a couple of different directions we could go from here. We could talk about the derivatives, for example, of inverse hyperbolic sine and inverse hyperbolic cosine. That's a good thing to do. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. So um, what's, let's just take a second here. What's the range of cosh? What's the range of cinch? Yeah. Uh, like one, two, one to infinity, right? One included. How about cinch? Right, the whole, the whole deal, right? Now, how does inverse of a function work, right? If you have a function, here's A, here's B, right? And a function goes from here to here. If this is the domain of F, right? And this is the range of F, if B is the range of F, the function said to be onto, whatever. Well, the inverse function goes this way, right? So we have these fundamental relations. The domain of the inverse function is in fact going to be the range of the function, providing in, provided an inverse exists, right? And vice versa. The range of the inverse function should be the domain of the function. These are things to kind of keep in mind as we think about inverse functions, you know? So <clears throat> if we think about how should, how should inverse hyperbolic cosine be defined? Cosh inverse of x should be what? The cosh of that should be what? Well, I mean, I'm asking what should cosh of cosh inverse of x be? x again, right? Um, let me use a y here. Because this is for y in the range of what? Cosh, right? Because in order for it to be in the domain of the inverse hyperbolic cosine, it must be in the range of the, co the hyperbolic cosine. In other words, inverse hyperbolic cosine is only defined for inputs from 1 to infinity. So y has to be um, 1, you know, less than or equal to y. We don't usually write this, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And likewise, cinch, I mean, the fundamental thing for cinch is what? Cinch of inverse hyperbolic sine of x, well, uh, is equal to x again. And of course, we, we also have the cinch inverse of cinch of x is what? I mean, both compositions have to give you back x, right? Although over here, I would be able to say a little bit different, right? Cosh inverse of cosh of x is equal to x for which x? Blank, less than x, less than blank. Fill in the blanks. When is this relation true? 1 to infinity? I'm, uh, I'm half right. So if, no one ever writes this, right? I mean, in other words, any x, because any x is in the domain of cosh. 
Okay, so the, these, these two relations don't have to hold for the same set of inputs. If the range and domain are different, then it doesn't have to be the same x in both spots. It so happens that the range and the domain of cinch are the same, so I can just say this and this for any x in the reals, and that's fine. All right, enough about that. So what's the derivative of inverse hyperbolic sine? Did I say? I said sine, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. Cinch inverse of x. What is this? Equal to this question. <clears throat> so what do we, what's our procedure here? If we use the same one I did last, last time, it's pretty simple. Call the thing you're trying to find the derivative of y, right? So I do something your book doesn't do a lot. I explain why things are true. I am, uh, I'm annoyed. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I, I, let me, let me, I'll try to hold it in. Let's focus on the math. Um, so this then tells us that the cinch of y is equal to, the, I mean, there is good, there, there are certainly good parts to your book, but there are things missing. Of course, this is x again, right? All right, great. Then next step is to differentiate cinch of y. We have to use the chain rule on the, I don't know why I'm wearing these glasses, I don't need them. Um, we have to use chain rule, oh, now it's fuzzy. Let me refocus. Ah, okay. This, I have to use chain rule because I'm differentiating y with respect to x, right? So this gives me what? This gives me cosh of y times dy dx. And the derivative of x with respect to x is, well, it's 1, right? All right, almost, almost there. dy dx is 1 over cosh y, right? Now, I need to convert that back to x, right? So x is equal to cinch y, right? So how do I convert a cosh to a cinch? So remember, we have cosh squared, um, cosh squared y minus cinch squared y equals to 1. This is an identity. So this tells me that cosh y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 plus cinch squared y, right? I mean, that's just doing algebra, but we can, we can refine that algebra, can't we? What do we know about cosh? Is it positive? Is it negative? What can we say? Positive. Right. right. Cosh is something, somebody you'd like to hang around, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make you feel bad. They'd always be positive. See here. I always build you up. Never tear you down. Good friend. See here. One over the square root. Or I guess they could be the person that drives you off the cliff. I don't know. If they don't see reality for what it is. You be careful about positive people. See here. I'm sorry. I should stop. Let's see here. So that's one over the square root of one plus x squared because cosh is positive, so we have to choose a positive square root. And there you go. DDX of inverse hyperbolic sine of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared, yeah? How does that compare to what we did last time? What did we prove last, yesterday? The derivative with respect to x of inverse sine of x, what was that equal to? Ah, right. Very good. Now this formula, the black formula, is good for all x, right? This is just 4x in the reals. The formula from yesterday, what's the, what's the domain in which this applies? Right, yeah. So between minus 1 to 1, um, because those are what, th that's the, 
Well, that's almost the range. That's almost the range of sine. We're missing endpoints, though, yeah? What is it? How did you turn the sine, uh, hyperbolic sine into the x right there? Okay. Mm hmm Good question. Um, so wh why do we lose the endpoints for inverse sine? Does that make sense geometrically? Inverse sine is the local inverse for sine where? Between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, right? So if the function has horizontal tangents at the endpoint, right? What about the inverse function? It's got, it's got vertical tangents. Yes, it does. And that's why we lose 1 and minus 1 here. And also the formula, you can see it blows up to infinity as x approaches plus or minus 1, right? All right. Anyway, just doing some sightseeing here. Now, we can derive the derivative of inverse hyperbolic cosine in much the same way, right? I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys, but I will tell you what the answer is. If I could find it. Ah! No! So here's some fun facts. And all of these can be derived through very similar arguments to the one I just gave, but the derivative with respect to x of hyperbolic cosh inverse, oh I just, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't remember what I've done. So that's almost the same, it's 1 over the square root. It's kind of like this, except x squared minus 1. Alright? And the derivative with respect to inverse hyperbolic tangent of x, it works out in fact to 1 over 1 minus x squared. The derivative with respect to x of inverse hyperbolic secant of x. I don't see this one quite as often. Um, this one is equal to minus 1 over x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. Derivative of inverse hyperbolic cotangent of x. <laughs> 1 over, hey look at this one. The tangent, the inverse hyperbolic tangent, and the inverse hyperbolic cotangent, same derivative. It's kind of funny. Isn't it? And finally, for the sake of completeness, and I probably, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have written these down. It's too late, though. Um, I mean, I think it's important to see them, at least. We don't need to derive all of them, but we should drive enough that we know how to do it, if we need to, right? This is actually theorem 5.25. Right. It also has the derivative of inverse hyperbolic sine, but I didn't write that down again because, hey, we just worked it out. Let me work out one more of these. Okay. Let's pick on, let's pick on the inverse hyperbolic tangent. All right. So let's work on this one. So what do we do? We're, we let y equal to inverse hyperbolic tangent of x. So that means what? Tanch of y is equal to x. <clears throat> so I'm working on the, I'm working on the proof of that, that derivative. So we, we differentiate implicitly. What's that give us? That gives us, we worked this out last time, right? This is hyperbolic secant squared of y times dy dx by chain rule. Uh, that's equal to 1. So we've got dy dx is 1 over hyperbolic secant squared y. What you want to do then is you want to go back and take the, the cosh cinch, sort of, it's not the Pythagorean identity, but it's like the Pythagorean identity, right? Take this one, and how do we get an identity for, for hyperbolic secant squared? Divide that identity by cosh squared. What happens? Uh, Cinch over cosh is called tanch. So we get 1 minus tanch squared equals to 1 over cosh squared. But 1 over cosh squared y is hyperbolic secant squared y. Now, this 
is what? In this problem, this is 1 minus x squared, right? There it is. See, because hyperbolic secant squared is 1 minus x squared in our current notation. So there you have it, ddx of inverse hyperbolic tangent of x is equal to 1 over 1 minus x squared. It's probably healthy for us to just take a, take a second and think about our life. What did we do yesterday? We derived the derivative of inverse tangent, right? What's the difference? How is it the same? How is it I mean, it's, it's like this, but it's not the same, right? Versus what, what did we have last time? What was the derivative of inverse tangent of x? Yeah, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now here's a question I can ask you. What x, I mean, we, we explained last, last time that this is for, for any x, right? For x in the reals. So the derivative inverse, hyper, inverse tangent, rather, 1 over 1 plus x squared for any x, right? How about the blue, blue box formula there? What x is that true for? Yep. Why? You get zero in the denominator at plus or minus one. So there must be trouble there. But why, why wouldn't it just be one to infinity and and minus one to minus infinity, or just one or the other, right? I mean, as long as we stay away from x, I mean, you're right. There's something special about plus or minus one, right? But you got other flavor choices in principle. <laughs> what is the real question? The real question is, what's the domain of inverse hyperbolic tangent, right? How do we figure out the domain of inverse hyperbolic tangent? What do you mean the range of The range of hyperbolic tangent. So how do we figure out what the range is of hyperbolic tangent? Like I look it up in a book? No, we think. <laughs> look at caution. Right, let's go back to basics and work it out. We can work it out. Let's do it. Let's graph hyperbolic tangent. So it's funny, right? We can calculate <laughs> we can calculate the derivative of the inverse function, right? But we don't even know what the graph of hyperbolic tangent looks like. It's really amazing how powerful the symbol pushing we're doing is, right? You can calculate things that you don't really understand if you can just do algebra. This is really kind of amazing. But I think we take it for granted. So here it is. Tanch of x is cinch of x over cosh of x, right? That's the definition of hyperbolic tangent. But let me point out something to you. We can write this as e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x. What happened, what happened to my halves? Right, there's a half upstairs, there's a half downstairs, so just cancel those things. Now, this is nice if we look at it two different ways. I mean, there's a couple different natural things to do here. The one is to factor in e to the x out. I mean, how you ever want to look at it? Um, this is equal to 1 minus e to the minus 2x over 1 plus e to the minus 2x, but it's also equal to 1 it's also equal e to the 2x uh, minus 1 over e to the 2x plus 1, right? Here I'm divide by, um, let me just say multiply by. Why am I saying divide? Let's multiply. We like multiplying, right? Multiply by e to the x over e to the x, right? Over here, multiply by what? Right, over e to the minus x, right? 
And either one of those moves clears out exponentials of x or exponentials of minus x, just leaving the other, right? The reason I do this is just to try to make clear to you the limiting behavior of this function. What happens as x goes to infinity? Uh, let's see here. As x goes to infinity, what happens as x gets really, really large? e to the minus 2x goes to what? Goes to 0, right? e to the minus 2x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. So this whole thing limits to what? It's basically this whole thing tends to 1 in this limit, right? On the other hand, if you look at the other expression, it's manifestly clear what happens as x goes to minus infinity. What happens as x goes to minus infinity in the other one? As x goes to minus infinity, e to the 2x goes to 0, right? Because e to a very small, a very large negative number is very, very small. And this whole expression limits to what? Well, it limits to minus 1 over 1, so minus 1. So my point to you is it's fairly clear from these expressions that the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of the tanch of x is equal to plus or minus 1. So those are horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes for the tangent, hyperbolic tangent function. Can you tell me why it mustn't cross its asymptotes? Is tanch continuous? Yep. Um, is it always increasing? Why? We have 1 over cosh squared x. This is 1 over something which never goes to 0. It is always positive. Therefore, the derivative of tanch is positive. This function is increasing, in fact, strictly increasing everywhere. It couldn't possibly cross its horizontal asymptote because if it crosses it, it has to come back down. Right? Because, so, there you go. Now, if you don't find this, if you don't find this believable, I mean, I'm claiming that it starts to be believable that minus 1 is less than tanch of x is less than 1 for all x. But let me show you how you prove that. If I can. It's actually not that hard. I don't think we need all these anymore. I mean, it's good to know them. I do expect, I really expect that you, uh, I'm not, I don't, I probably don't want you to memorize all of those. I, I do think you should have the derivative of inverse hyperbolic tangent member memorized probably. And maybe the inverse cosh and cinch. It's certainly the cosh cinch. You should be able to derive any of them, right? But I might not expect you to remember any of them. Kind of depends on the context here. Certainly in homework, you're expected to know, know them all. All right, so here it is. Check it out. I'll start in the middle. I have e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x, All right? This is what? This is hyperbolic tangent of x, the whole thing, right? Now I'm going to play some games. I'll make this smaller or larger. All right. So first of all, I'll go this direction. Can you tell me why this inequality is true? What did I do? I removed, I made the numerator smaller, right? And the denominator is positive. So if you make the numerator smaller of a positive fraction, I mean, the other way around. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I have stopped. I'm not subtracting a positive quantity, right? So the numerator is cl clearly larger than it was on the left. 
Do you agree? Okay. What happens if you make the denominator of a fraction, a positive fraction, um, smaller? The fraction gets larger, right? So this is e to the x over e to the x, and that is 1. So it's bounded above by 1. How about the other direction? The other direction, you guys tell me why this is a reasonable step. What did I do? Going from this to that, the denominator, the numerator stays the same, the denominator did what? It, it got bigger. bigger. What did I do? Oh, smaller. smaller. What? What? Hey. That's no bueno. Sorry, all of a sudden I'm confused. Huh? It made sense to me when I wrote it earlier. Schnikes. Well, I can't do that. Curses. Hmm. Maybe I should just, uh, you guys will help me fix it. Let's see here, e to the x plus e to the minus x. Um, what can I make that, what can I, I could just do this, right? I removed a positive quantity, I made the numerator smaller, right? That, that step is, is clearly reasonable. And let's see here. Ah, uh, shnikes. That's not what I wanted. Oh, well, you win some, you lose some. So you guys, how can we finish this argument and put a minus one over there with steps like I'm making? I think it can be done. But being that I don't have 10 minutes of class to figure it out, let me not do that. I do have something else to show you with the time that remains. So there, there you go. There's an open problem for you to try to figure it out. Okay? If you show me how to do this and bring it to me to start a class tomorrow, I'll give you two points. All right? You know what I'm saying? Figure out what inequality steps you can make here to get a minus one. Right? Yep. I, I have to replace, I have to go from a fraction, I, I want a smaller fraction, right? So if I get rid of the e to the minus x on the bottom. No, not the e to the minus x, just the e to the x first. Where? The yeah. top of the denominator. So many e to the x's. <laughs> <laughs> the denominator, the last side is the denominator. Get rid of the... Oh, because I'm still I think. Well, oh well, I guess nobody gets points. See, I hope we... Uh, let the record show everyone gets the points. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually a very good point. We just made the fraction larger in magnitude, and since it's negative, right. Perfect, thank you. Very good point. See, I'm reminded of when I visited my brother at Bob Jones. I was sitting in class with him, and the professor did something. And then Bill's like, he's like, he doesn't need to do that. Blah, 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 blah. He like shows me this. I'm like, why don't you tell him? And Bill's like, <laughs> I'm like, and then sure enough, like a minute later, Dr. Guthrie's like, if any of you can show me a better way to do this, I'll give you five bonus points. <laughs> Bill's like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. All right, everyone gets two bonus points. All right, yeah, so we're good. All right, I, now it's like no one got any points because I curve, but anyway. I do, but thank you very much. That, that's very helpful. And maybe that's what I was thinking when I wrote it, but anyway. Um, so what I have written is correct. It's just what when my mind was wrong. Okay, so, long story short, 
What we have shown is that basically there's horizontal asymptotes, one and minus one, and tanch looks just essentially like this. So this is y equals hyperbolic tangent of x. So we can, we can answer now with authority the question I posed over here for which x? Minus one, less than x, less than one. So you were, you were in fact correct. Who said that? Okay. I forgot. Name names. No, it's okay. It is kind of, it is kind of cute, right? Like the, in, the tanch of x kind of looks like inverse, the graph of inverse, tan, inverse, arc, inverse regular tangent, right? It's kind of curious. But, okay. Now, there's something in your book. Your book has a lot of nice results. Basically, I'm, I'm hitting the high points in section 5.9. We will start on integration by parts tomorrow. All right? But one of the things that your book does, and I am really quite, I'm pretty disappointed because it's really a missed opportunity. Um, is it gives you these formulas for inverse hyperbolic functions in terms of algebraic functions and natural logs, but it doesn't explain where they come from. It just, these are true. Here, check it out, it works. Well, that's great, but don't, do you think students might want to know why? I mean, I think students want to know why. If we don't care about why, we might as well just forget about it, call it a day, and just use Wolfram Alpha, you know? Forget about an education, forget about degrees, or maybe we just get a printer out and print a bunch of degrees. People come in off the street, we give them $1,000, give you $1,000, give you a degree. Good, now use Wolfram Alpha, you know? <laughs> no, I don't think that's what we're after. We want to understand things, right? Well, I, I want to understand things. If, if you don't want to understand things, then we'll probably have trouble. Um, anyway, why is this true? So here's how you figure it out. Tanch of inverse hyperbolic tanch of x is equal to what? It's equal to x, right? So all you do is call this thing y because basically we're trying to understand what is that thing. Give it a name, call it y. And so then we have that tanch of y is equal to x. But what is tanch? We just got done looking at this over here, right? This is e to the y minus e to the minus y over e to the y plus e to the minus y equals to x. Right? Now I just need to solve. I mean, solve for, for y, basically. And so it's a little, maybe you haven't done this algebra before, but that's exactly why we should be doing this. To learn algebra. In fact, that's a lot of the reason you should take calculus too, is to learn the algebra that you never really learned. Many people. I'm one of those people. So, fine. Now what you can do is if we just multiply this equation by e to the y, what happens? Right? Multiply by e to the y. We clear out the e to the minus y's. And now let's isolate y. See, we have e to the y um, times 1 minus x is equal to x plus 1. As I said, I meant e to the 2y, right? Sorry, I'll start working up here so you can see it. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs> if I keep writing down there, I'm going to have to get you guys to do like stretching exercises before class. They're so going to hurt your neck. It's your... Okay, so we have e, I'll rewrite it. This step is a rerun. e to the 2y, minus 1 times 1 minus x equals to x plus 1. Okay, great. So e to the 2y is equal to x plus 1 over 1 minus x. Can you solve for y? I hope so. We take the natural log of both sides.
hey, wait a second, in order to make sense of this, I need what? That better be positive. For which x is this quotient positive? Do you guys know how to figure out where a rational function is positive and negative? Make a sign chart. Minus 1, 1, x plus 1 over 1 minus x. Plug in minus 2, get a negative number. Plug in 0, get a positive number. Yeah. Plug in 2, get a negative number. This function is continuous except that its asymptotes and it's 0. I mean, excuse me, it only can change signs at a vertical asymptote or a 0, this rational function. Consequently, this is only positive where? Minus 1, less than x, less than 1. No surprises there, but that's, cons I mean, this step of taking the natural log is only valid for such x. And so we get 2y is the natural log of x plus 1 over 1 minus x. And so y is 1 half natural log of x plus 1 over 1 minus x. And by the way, y is, what was it? Inverse hyperbolic tangent of x. And that is how you derive that the inverse hyperbolic tangent can be written in terms of natural logs, a natural log of an algebraic function. Okay. This is not in your book. Not cool, folks, not cool. And he, um, he has more of these. I mean, the results he has in the book, but the explanations for why they're true, not so much. It's very unfortunate. So tomorrow, guys, I'll start for last probably by showing you why cosh inverse of x is the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. So tomorrow, we'll start by showing this. And I won't show it, I won't show it by just proving it's an inverse function, which is what he says to do in the book. I'm going to derive it using algebra, which is what I just did. This is a derivation of this formula, right? I'm not just saying it works, I'm showing how to find it, yeah. I don't need to. I mean, I just showed that this fraction here, right? This, this fraction, there's a sign chart for the fraction. It has a zero. I mean, this is its uh, vertical asymptote, right? This is its zero, because that's where the denominator. And so it can only change signs here and here. It's positive in between. It's negative out there. So my natural log is, is legit. Now, you're, you're, you're of course right. If you, if you want to be sure about taking logs, you just put absolute values on everything in sight and then take logs to your, to your heart's desire. As long as it's not zero, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, I guess that's it for today. How was race, how was race convo? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, does that sound wrong? What?